Catch Me If You Can tells the incredible true life story of Frank Abagnale Jr., one of the greatest con men of the 20th century. Let's talk about Steven Spielberg's film starring Leonardo DiCaprio. Hello, movie friends. Welcome to Raiders of the Lost Podcast, the ultimate film and TV podcast. Today, we're going to be discussing one of our favorite films of the 21st century and what we consider to be one of Spielberg's, one of, one Spielberg's. Steven, <laughs> one of Steven Spielberg's <laughs> most underappreciated films, Catch Me If You Can, starring uh, the great Leonardo DiCaprio and Tom Hanks, as well as a huge ensemble cast, which a lot of young actors who are now big stars, as well as a lot of veteran actors. I adore this film. It's a movie that I've revisited many, many times. I'm probably closing in on 20 watches of this movie. And every time I watch it, it's well, I get this feeling every time I watch a Spielberg movie, except for like maybe the darker ones like Schindler's List or Amistad or, or Saving Private Ryan. But when I watch Spielberg movies, it make they make me feel warm. They make me feel infectiously in love with cinema. His style of directing, he really could be the greatest director of movies of all time. Just the way he moves his camera, the way he instructs John Williams to make the music, the way the editing comes about. Uh, it's just really, I always feel like this kind of nostalgic, I don't know how to describe, if it is nostalgic because, I mean. Uh, there's magic. He's yeah, a magic, magic storyteller. There's something about Spielberg movies, no matter the tone, no matter the genre, I, I just love, love, love them. They transport me into like this giddy little film goer that. I mean, nothing else does that. I think I can't think of another filmmaker that does that for me. And Catch Me If You Can is an example of a movie I've seen so many times, but I watched it last night to prep for this episode, and I was just so happy while watching it. No one captures the magic of cinema like Steven Spielberg. He's kind of in his own planet, his own universe when it comes to that kind of storytelling. There are obviously every, so many great directors out there, but like you said, there's something about his movies. They're just a different form of escape escapism, and Catch Me If You Can is arguably one of his most underrated movies. Yes, it was a commercial hit. It made $350 million globally on a budget of $52 million, two Oscar nominations, one for John Williams, one for the great Christopher Walken, who is phenomenal in this movie. I always forget how good he is because Leo is such a big star, but Christopher Walken steals every goddamn scene in this movie. It's kind of like uh, Christopher Walken's movie for the first 20 minutes. He's, he's yeah. sensational in this film, and you know everyone forgets he's an Oscar winner. He's... The Pasha Emperor this year coming out, so I'm super excited about that. <laughs> the Emperor, the Emperor in Dune. <laughs> Nobody knows what Padasha means, man. <laughs> but with Catch Me If You Can, Steven Spielberg, this is a very underrated movie because of how many famous and great movies he's made. I mean, when you put up together a list, the average person puts together a list of top five, top ten Spielberg movies. Seldom will you see Catch Me If You Can up there. We put it in both of our top ten lists when we did our episode with the Extra Credits podcast, which was super fun to do. And we all had Catch Me If You Can in our top five, I think, all, all four of us, which was really cool to see. Because I think film lovers and cinephiles, they know how good this movie is and they love it. But for the average film goer, when they think of Steven Spielberg, they don't really think of Catch Me If You Can. They think of his more grandois fantasy films or science fiction films. They think of Jurassic Park or even Minority Report over this. So I think that, and I mean Raiders of the Lost Ark, obviously, because he's made so many incredible incredible movies et that shape childhoods and and create film fans and film lovers but catch me if you can there's something about it it's just this great adventure stranger than fiction true story well there are parts that are true and what frank abagnale jr says about the movie is about 80 percent of it is correct however he has been fact checked quite a bit the last 20 years <laughs> and we'll talk about that i want to save a lot of the fact checking for the end of the film because i don't want to take away from the magic of the movie because if we open up with like this was not true this was not true we can't open up with snopes bro yeah exactly i think it'd be like oh well, i don't even want to listen to the episode anymore i didn't know <laughs> i didn't know that was not true but there is a quite a bit that's true but obviously sensationalized for hollywood and obviously frank abigail jr was a great con man and Obviously, probably conned people about the story at the same time. <laughs> yeah, as conning people. He's an unreliable. When he wrote the book, he's an yeah. unreliable storyteller. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> and the, the, that's a good point you made. Steven Spielberg has made so many insanely successful films. Um, I was having a conversation with someone about it the other day. Has the commercial success of a Spiel, of Spielberg m does it make people forget of the uh, the smaller films he makes, or even are they aware of other films that he makes? I mean. The, the Post and Bridge of Spies, they just came out this past several years, and they are unbelievable movies, and they're they're so good. 
and but nobody saw them. You know, people saw Ready Player One. People people saw his last few films. The Terminal's a uh, the movie term- like that too. Yeah, yeah. Terminal. Yeah, it came out in like oh eight oh seven. Um, and so I suppose that since he's made so many massive movies that his other movies kind of get lost in the shadow of the success of his juggernauts. But make no mistake, he has made so many more mid-tier budget scale movies that are absolutely sensational, remarkable films. Um, And this is one of them, $50 million budget. This is pretty small for a Spielberg movie, especially around this time in the 2000s. He a Minority Report actually came out in the same year as this, and then uh, War of the Worlds. Um, so he was he was still doing monstrous, huge budget science fiction films while he made something like this. And this is a much more understated film. And even though it's smaller in budget, it actually is in a way bigger in scope because the production of this film is massive. There are actually 152 locations. There's a of ton this of scenes. Movie. Yeah, this is a, this is the only Spielberg movie. Where it kind of, where it kind of feels like a, a Scorsese movie like The Irishman or Goodfellas yeah. or The Wolf of Wall Street, yeah. where what what Scorsese does so well with those films specifically are just the sheer number of scenes and locations that they use to make the film. I mean, there are so many scenes in those movies; it's fucking mind blowing. When you watch Goodfellas or when you watch The Wolf of Wall Street, you're like, "How do they film this many scenes and fit it into a two and a half hour movie?" There's like eight hundred things. Well, three hours of The Irishman. <laughs> yeah. Um, but Goodfellas, I mean, there's like literally 120 scenes. That's crazy. Um, this is an this movie is an example of something similar like that. It's long in scope. It's epic. It tells the story of uh, an epic story over a long period of time, but just the sheer scope of the scale, the size of it geographically uh, and in um, the filming of it physically is really impressive and something that I hadn't really seen in a Spielberg movie. This is like sheer number of different kinds of location settings, um, sets, and that's what I found really impressive and really refreshing for a Spielberg film. And the story's incredible. We've all seen this movie, and I love how the film opens up with not just after the uh, great opening title sequence, which is phenomenal, tells its own story. The music from John Williams is terrific in this film, so much jazz. And I feel like the opening sequence and opening titles for this movie has just been replicated by every TV show now and that every TV (laughs) show needs to have a sick-ass, kick-ass title credit sequence. Didn't Mad Men do something like this? Mad Men was 2007, though, when it came out. Okay, But Mad Men was pretty similar in terms of, like, kind of, like, the silhouetted cartoons. Yeah, yeah, yeah. In a lot of ways, but I feel like... (laughs) I'm not saying that Catch Me If You Can did it first, but every TV show now has a great opening title credit sequence, and I think that Catch Me If You Can was a major influence on that. Well, so the title credit sequence was created by a duo called, they're named Oliver Kunstel and Florence Degas, and they used stamp-style animation. It was, so it was physically created, these graphics. They're, they weren't made in a computer Also, or it's like old-school South Park. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And it, it's a two-and-a-half-minute sequence that features silhouettes of the main characters, and they actually act out the entire plot of the film, even down to the smallest details, bit by bit. So if you watch this title sequence carefully they actually give you the entire story and film you're about to watch in this condensed version it's kind of like mission impossible opening Mm -hmm. and obviously this was made in the style of saul bass who was probably the most famous graphic designer in american history saul bass created a lot of the opening title credits for some of your favorite for many of your favorite movies from the 60s 70s and 80s a lot of hitchcock movies as well as doing actual physical paper graphic design work he really elevated the craft of graphic design in a big way and if you if a person studies graphic design they study saul bass and they probably adore saul bass and so this was like a harkening back to the kinds of um, graphic design work, but also poster designs that he did for movies. He did a lot of posters. Got The Shining right here. He exactly. Did. Yeah. Okay. Exactly. Yeah. Kubrick hired him for that, and so and that's actually that's actually much different from his usual kind of style. Kubrick had him do like 150 different mockups, but that's a whole another movie right there. They actually used rubber stamps that could be carved out for each character they created in the opening sequence for Catch Me If You Can. Yeah. Very cool. Mm-hmm. I, I love it so much. And like I said, it, like you said, it does tell the story. It's so similar to like Mission Impossible. You're going to see like scenes and kind of like the plot right away. <laughs> but there are some things that are a little different in the opening title sequence. I feel like they added some stuff that they left out of the movie. Kind of like how he was a professor professor of sociology, Frank Abagnale Jr. But it might have been something they filmed but didn't fit in the film. I think so, yeah. possibly. Now, 
This story is sensational and obviously embellished for Hollywood. And obviously, Frank Abagnale Jr. is a con man. I'm sure he embellished a lot of the story himself, but it still makes for an incredible movie. And the rights for this film were purchased back in 1980 when he wrote his book, which was in the 1970s and came out with it. He was even on that TV series like they opened the show, the movie up with that truth show to try to guess who the real Frank Abagnale Jr. is. Yeah, guess who the person, yeah. In 1977, he really appeared on that show. And I thought that was really cool to open up how it kind of was and tell the story basically the synopsis of the movie <laughs> in a fun way which is really interesting the rights bounced around for a couple decades never got made into anything just was in production hell for about 17 years until steven spielberg bought the rights after it bounced around a couple different studios so spielberg purchased the rights to catch me if you can the book in 1997 and he originally wanted gore verbinski to direct the film and the screenplay was written by Jeff Nathanson, who did a terrific job with this script. Uh, it's based on the semi-biographical book of the same name by Frank Abagnale Jr., who claims that before his 19th birthday, he successfully performed cons worth millions of dollars po- by posing as a Pan American World Airways pilot, a Georgia doctor, and a Louisiana parish prosecutor, as well as a sociology professor, which they don't do in the movie, but it's hinted at by him teaching his French class in high school in the opening (laughs) of the first act of the film. However, again, the truth of the story is questionable and has been fact-checked quite a bit, quite a big bit. And so eventually after Spielberg got the rights with his DreamWorks production company, he wanted David Fincher, Gore Verbinski, Lass Hallstrom, or Miles Foreman, and even also Cameron Crowe. Milos all, Foreman. M- Milos Foreman were all considered to <laughs> direct the film <laughs> before Spielberg decided to direct it himself. Leo was attached to it pretty early on, and James Gald- Gandolfini was actually originally going to play Hanratty, Carl Hanratty, that Tom Hanks took over the role for in this film. But then they eventually cast everyone, Christopher Walken, J- John Williams, both getting nominations for Best Original Score and Best Supporting Actor, opened up in Christmas Day 2002 to mm. massive critical acclaim. Ironically, Gore Verbinski had to drop out because they delayed the film so much because Leo had to do reshoots on Gangs of New York. And so by and the he t- was doing yeah. Pirates of the Caribbean, right? So Gore Verbinski had a commitment to Pirates, and so by the time Leo finally was free, he Gore Verbinski could no longer make the film. And this movie is in the top 200 on IMDb. It's rated at an 8.1. It's number 173 on top rated movies on IMDb's user list. Rotten Tomatoes, it is a 96% critic score. I couldn't get the audience score because that page on Rotten Tomatoes is broken right now. I tried finding it. They erased it. Yeah, they erased <laughs> they it. They don't want anyone to see it. It's got a 12%. <laughs> no, no, I doubt that. Let's check its letterbox score. I bet it has a... Fairly decent letterbox. I'm not guessing. It'll, I'm guessing it might not even be over four. What's your prediction for letterbox? Yeah. If it's not a four point one, I'm just gonna end this episode and walk out the door. <laughs> At least a four point one. It's a four. He's still here, everyone. He's still here, everyone. See ya. He didn't leave yet. See ya. <laughs> a four. Come on, letterbox. You're always breaking my heart. But remember, I mean, my heart. <laughs> my heart. Remember when these movies, movies like this, used to make this much money? I mean. Obviously, it has DiCaprio behind it, who was a, who is in a way the box office king, and also Tom Hanks, but in Spielberg behind the name is behind the film as well. But you know, films like this, no matter who's making the movies anymore, they don't make this kind of money at at all. They don't even come close to it. Can you compare box office king? You you call Leo the box office king compared to someone like Samuel Jackson, who has like the highest box office of all time. Correct. So let's let's differentiate by what we mean by Leo being the box office. King. I would say because Leo's average is three hundred and fifty million dollars per movie, and on top of that, he's bounced around every genre and also avoided uh, the superheroes and Star Wars. No offense to Sam. I mean, make well, your, I mean, make Zoe Zaldana's up there as well because part of massive franchises, yeah. movies that make two three billion dollars yes. just because. It's Avatar, yeah. you know what I mean? And also, Sam's up there because of voice acting work as well. Uh, with The Incredibles 1 and 2 were hugely successful movies, so those helped put him over the top above Harrison Ford. Uh, but I would say because of DiCaprio's a- um, average movie gross and also him being pretty much the lead of every single movie except for Django Unchained, he is the lead of every movie since uh, Gilbert Grape. He's not the lead in that. I mean, since Titanic and every it's like his movie. He is the draw as opposed to it being an ensemble 
as opposed to it being a giant extravagant action extravaganza. It's DiCaprio selling the film, and I think that's what really sets him apart from anyone else. I completely agree, and that's why I wanted people to understand what we meant by it. Even though Do he's you not concur? The, I concur. I should have concurred. should have concurred. <laughs> Even though he doesn't have the numbers of all time. Exactly. But he's the lead. He's the draw. He's not in massive franchises. He's. I mean, I love Sam L, but I mean, how much screen time does he have in all the Avengers movies not combined? Not much, exactly. That's my MCU, point. In yeah. MCU, and then, but he's part of that. Twenty billion dollar franchise, yeah. so that's added to and his also box even office. the Incredibles. He only has a, a minor amount of screen time in the Star Wars movies. He has a very minor amount of screen time. So I think when when you're comparing it, uh, he obviously has the overall number, but you got to com- look at it differently. As what it, what 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 are they serving to the film? In particularly Leo, in particular Leo is the the fucking ninety percent of the screen is him. So I think it's more impressive. And this movie is just terrific it, it hits everything you want in a spielberg film or in a movie in general i mean it's got a long runtime but it flies by and it's so enjoyable because there are so many sequences and, and i love movies that kind of take place over a course of somebody's life even though it really covers only about three to five no, like about five to ten years of frank abagnale's life the majority of it, his teenage years when he was from age 16 to 19 doing all of his cons running around the world basically you just can't help but feel like this is going to be the coolest life of all time. Maybe one of the most interesting people to exist in the 20th century in America, basically. And just, just the way he took the government for a ride in a lot of ways, whether or not this was all true, still being able to do that. And then ending up on top at the end, even though he had so much turmoil, he was arrested multiple times, to still end his story in his life on top of everything, an expert in your field, basically, and wildly successful. It's just a like a perfect Hollywood story for a movie. Yeah, and it was reported that Abagnale, one of the reasons why he was able to pull off the cons at such a young age was because he actually looked old for his age. And if you look, I've looked at photos of him online. He does look like a grown man when he was 16. He looks, he looks like he could pull it off, so it definitely helped being tall and having a, a more mature-looking face. And so that's a, uh, something that really ad- aided him in his favor of being able to convince people that he was an adult and he was at least in his mid twenties. Yeah, he already hit six foot when he was fifteen years Damn. old. Damn. And so, like, he, like you said, it's unlike the boyish mm-hmm. look that Leo does in this. Yeah, movie, ironically, yeah, he actually had a very mature or older look when he was a teenager. But Leo does a lot with his voice in the film that helps change. How old is he in this movie? Because Leo, when he made the film, so in two thousand six, yeah, he looks like he's fifteen in half the movie. Well, he's had, he's always had a baby face. Yeah, until about maybe two thousand tens, he really started at age. And show his age. It's just great makeup and wardrobe and hair. When you when you messy when you mess up someone's hair to make it a little messy and it'll make them look a lot younger. And then if you pull it back and it'll make and sleek it back and maybe side part it, it'll make him look much more mature. Like so, when he's the doctor or exactly. a lawyer. Exactly. So how you how a person presents themselves most notably with their hair can make a, a major factor in how um, they can be perceived by others. But Leo does a lot of great vocal work in the film, um, where he can change pitch really really effortlessly um whether he's being uh, the young boy at the opening of the film and then being uh a suffered man who's been in prison for several years in france uh, and what's interesting is spielberg edits between those two sequences and you can really see the age that the is performing and how he's really aged the, the the character not just by eight or nine years but physically and emotionally and you can feel it in his voice and in his posture as well so leo does a lot of great vocal work and also uh it's smart of him when i love when he's like when he calls the pan am hotline to get a new uniform he uses a, a southern accent to make sure that to, as like a way of making sure nobody can ever like pin him as uh the culprit if it's a person with a southern accent if something's ever reported as a crime they'll be like oh yeah the guy had a southern accent Kind of keeps him off scot free, but also when he he hires he he raises the pitch of his voice when he goes to Pan Am for the school paper interview, and his posturing, his hair, he has this nervous twitch about him. He looks like a teenager, but then we cut to uh, the next scene and he is pretending to be an adult and he's suave and he's got his strong posture and a deeper voice. So Leo did a lot vocally and physically to convince the audience really seamlessly of every step in uh, Frank Abagnale's life and transition from age to age. 
the cast is really sensational. And obviously, Leo's terrific in every movie he's in. Christopher Walken, like I said, is such a scene stealer. Really deserved an Oscar nomination. He's terrific in this movie. Martin Sheen's in this movie. Natalie Bay. Amy Adams in a really early role. This is before she was even doing The Office. Brian Howe. Frank John Hughes. Steve Easton. Chris Ellis. Jennifer Garner, again, a very early role. This is while she was doing Alias on TV, so she was just getting into Hollywood and blowing up. Elizabeth Banks, another early role for her. So, and Ellen Pompeo. Yeah, don't forget about Dr. Gray, bro. <laughs> Can't forget about Dr. Gray. You know, they've almost made 500 episodes of Gray's Anatomy. What a gig, man. Yeah. What a gig. My God. Just yeah. making How bank. much money has she made? A lot, She's probably. She's probably making a million an episode by now. Maybe. Yeah, something she's still like that. On, still doing it? Uh, yeah, I think it was her last... Her last season was this year. It was a big farewell. <laughs> but again, the, but the cast is phenomenal, and the characters are sensational, and I just love Frank Abagnale Jr. as a character. So interesting, charming, innocent, highly relatable, kind of somebody who... You know, you wish you were like when you were in your youth, the kind of confidence he has, and everything about the character was created basically and influenced by his father, Frank Abagnale Sr. And I think Spielberg does a terrific job showing the influence of Frank Sr. on Frank Jr. They even look similar. They have a similar smile. Yeah. The blue eyes, the casting was terrific job with Leo and Christopher Walken together. And they just seem like best friends. And clearly, Jr. is obsessed with his father. His father is his hero. And the deterioration of their family and his and of Frank Sr.'s power and wealth and his job and his status in the community with the Rotary Club especially is basically what leads to Frank wanting to, in the film, never let that happen to him and runs away eventually after the divorce and destruction of his family. But everything he picks up on when it comes to conning, he gets from his father. And they do such a great job in the script and directing showing this, whether it's Frank Sr. trying to get that loan at the bank and that whole sequence is set up with him conning the woman at the suit store the, uh, did you, I conning found the on, bank manager. Yeah, I found this yeah. on the sidewalk, this necklace, this trick that Frank Jr. adopts later on when he's conning women later on and lying basically about it's for a funeral for their grandfather. A, a 21 gun salute's going to happen. The planes overhead mm -hmm. and the bank loan, going going to the bank, pretending, having Frank pretend he's the driver of the car. Everything Gets him a new uniform. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Everything that Frank Jr. knows about conning, he learned from his father and his father. Just like Frank Jr., he can't stop conning the people he loves and the people he's trying to take advantage of or or get things out of, whether it's when they're losing their home, he's conning his family, basically saying, like, this is better, like, the there's less work for you to do, this is going to be, in the long run, this is going to be better for everybody, basically make, conning people into accepting bad news, which is just happening to their family. Yeah, he lies that selling the car was a good deal, we took him. They we took him for 500, yeah. yeah. I'm, I'm glad you brought this up, because I think it's the most interesting dynamic of the entire film. And on top of that, so Frank Sr., he often he's, he has a couple of slogans um, in the film, and one of them obviously is, why do the Yankees always win? Everybody always says the Yankees win because they have Mickey Mantle. No, it's because everybody nobody can stop looking at their pinstripes. So uh, Frank Sr. has built his life upon appearances being the most important facet to someone. Appearances. So he is... Um, well, and impressions, and, I would say. Yeah, first yeah. impressions. Well, yeah, in, 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 your appearance is essentially a first is Yeah. It, they, they are related. Um, but in terms of the destruction of the family comes from Frank Sr. putting, like, creating this fake appearance of himself and of his family. Uh, he is deep in debt because he bought things he couldn't afford. He, they couldn't, af he, they never could have afforded that car. They never could afford that house. They never could afford the fancy clothes and, and, and nice meals and comfortable furniture they have in the home. But Frank Sr. bought it all and, and probably got it all on credit and loans because he, for him, appearances are everything. Which is why he's being audited by exactly. the IRS. Exactly. He's being the, uh, audited. And this, I like how Spielberg and the writers, they didn't do too much exposition, exposition, but they did enough where we can completely understand what's going on. He's built this life that he couldn't afford because for him... You gotta make the pin. You gotta have, you gotta wear the pinstripes. You gotta wear. You, this that's how the Yankees win. That's how I win at life. I have to wear the pinstripes. And I love real quick. I love when he's, he thinks he's being arrested by the FBI. He's like, I'd like to put on a better suit if that's exactly. okay with you. If that's okay with you. <laughs> that's another great example. And so, his entire life has been built around creating a false sense of who he is, who they, and where they are socially in the social class system of being high class, of being upper class, and also being a part of the Rotary Club. He says. 
in this speech when he was given the award at the Rotary Club, that was him. He was the, obviously the mouse metaphor. And when the mouse climbed out and survived, that's who he was in that moment. Like getting that award at the Rotary Club was the biggest goal in his life and the ultimate achievement in terms of keeping up this masquerade of appearances. And so this is what Frank Jr. ends up building his entire life around when he runs away from home. Appearances, the cons, like you mentioned earlier. Um, but he thinks that what his dad built in the past is what really mattered. That's why he's obsessed with getting it all back. And it's not until the end of the film where Frank, in a way, realizes that none of it really mattered. And it was all for nothing, in a way. And it was a completely wrong way to live. And that all connects to his mother, to Frank's mother and Frank's and Frank Sr.'s wife, who he meets in France, we can assume, uh, during World War II, after the Germans have been kicked out. We can assume. We, they don't explain, but it's why would American soldiers be in France otherwise at the time. Now, Paula Abagnale, who we met in this small French town, he didn't speak a word of French. There were 200 men in this, 200 soldiers with him, and they were in the small little building that the French were throwing a party, and she started dancing, and he said... I'm not leaving France without her, basically. And you can assume that he used every trick in his book to get Paula in his life and to not swindle her, but to make her fall, fall in love with him and come to America with him. And we can assume that that was his plan and maybe everything didn't work out as they both planned on because they do have a, a tension-filled relationship even before the divorce. You can see there's tension there. But... Frank Sr. is so charismatic and so confident, things that he passes on to his son, Frank Jr., that I, I think one of my favorite scenes in the whole movie that I think flies under the radar for importance in a great metaphor is when Frank Jr. and his family are still together and they're in the living room and they have music playing. Yeah, but I wanted to say this. I got you. <laughs> <laughs> and then um, his mother spills the wine on the white carpet and she gets upset and then... Frank Jr. goes to get a towel. Go get a, a towel, Frankie. And Frank Sr. grabs his wife and he's like, don't worry about it. Dance with me, honey. Dance with me, sweetheart. And what are they dancing on top of? They are dancing on top of a stain on the carpet. They're red wine. They're dancing on the red wine, which for me is a metaphor of their relationship, which is not perfect. But there's only so much dancing you can do on top of it to hide the fact that it is not perfect. And it will probably end at some point. And basically... A lot of it is superficial, but really the dancing is kind of just like a facade, a temporary kind of home that they've created. Yeah. At some point, it's going to fall apart. In, in uh, uh, Frank Sr. is too carefree. And like you said, he's... the So the, the wine stain, it's a problem, and it's a real problem. It'll ruin the carpet. This is a beautiful white rug, and the, this red wine's going to ruin it. But... Frank Sr. brushes it under the rug, under brushes it under the rug. Essentially, he's he's like, "Don't worry about it. No pun intended. We're just gonna dance. <laughs> We're just gonna enjoy life, as opposed to fixing any problems that we have, and preparing for anything, preparing for the worst." And so, I'm so glad that you brought that up because that's it's a great uh, visual metaphor for the world that Frank Sr. has built for his family. Where, in a way, it's kind of like. They he's built this beautiful home on a foundation made of sand, in a way. You know what I mean? I think con men and con women they're great distractors, and I think that's what Frank Senior's done his whole life is distract everybody from who he truly is and who he actually is when it comes to his finances and his status as a person and his social class. And it's something that Frank Junior picks up on. There's a great line where he's talking to Carl Hanratty on the phone. And Carl's like basically asking him like how he gets away with things. And Frank Jr. says a great line. He says, people only believe what you tell them. And that's probably something that he learned just from watching his father, whether it's with his mother or watching his father at the Rotary Club, smoozing with the most wealthy and, power wealthy and powerful people of the city, even though he's not one of them technically, but pretending to be one of them, basically telling them all, I am part of this club. And what's he say to Frank Jr. when he gets him his checkbook? You're part of the little club now. And it's all about belonging to a special class or a specific kind of person and where the money is. And he's like, someday you'll want something from these people, a house or a car. They have all the money. 
And that's what a great line I think he says in the kitchen where his his tone goes low and he says they have all the money, showing that he never had any of the money. And also, like I said earlier, the first 20 minutes of this movie, it really is Frank Sr.'s story more so than it is Frank Jr.'s story. Um, we're seeing... We're we're watching everything through the eyes of Frank Jr., but like it really is Frank Sr. is is driving the story and plot and all the sequences that we see. And that's it's it's really a brilliant way to open the film because this, like you said, this is what everything Frank is learning, we're getting basically a condensed version of it, which informs everything about the character for the rest of the movie. Where So we get a really good sense for where Frank picked all this up. How could he possibly become such a successful con man at such a young age and so quickly? Because he's been watching a con man his entire life. So I thought it was really smart for the filmmakers to really set the stage for who Frank becomes by showing us who he, who he uh, mirrored. You know, if children mirror their parents... And Frank Jr. absolutely mirrored Frank Sr. And it's why it's so devastating to the family when they lose their business, they lose the shop, he loses his wealth, he's wealth that he never really had because he's being audited, he he owes taxes, and when they lose their home and Frank Jr. has to go to a different school, the family's destroyed, and it's only inevitable until the divorce comes in, and 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 Frank's wife ends up getting together with one of his buddies from the club, someone who's in the club, really, the president, president of the yeah. Rotary Club, and Jack, and they end up having a family themselves, which this, like, in that great scene where uh, Frank Jr. finds his mom and looks through that window at the yeah. end of the film, which is fictional, but it's really a great moment for the movie. Oh, it's great. I, that scene makes me cry, and I, just, I get goosebumps every time I watch it. And this film... Speaking of that scene, and ultimately the driving force of the film, it is a tragedy. And this film is very light, very playful, very entertaining, highly engaging, and a heck of a lot of fun. But it's also, uh, that's basically the vehicle for portraying a real tragedy in the this, this of the American, disillusionment of the American dream, and then also the destruction of a family and a broken home. And ever since I was a, a, a kid... Um, I, I really related to this film because this film, it, it tackles divorce in a broken home and a separated family and what that can do to a young boy or a young girl and, and how difficult it is to deal with that and to process it. And as children of divorce, I mean, I'm, I've always like connected to this film, um, very strongly because I've been through what Frank's been through. I, I've, I've felt those feelings and I've, and you have that kind of like the division of your parents, and it's a difficult thing to deal with when your parents don't want to be together anymore. And it, it's very tragic. And Spielberg obviously went through a divorce uh, of his parents' divorce when he was a child, and he's put that in a lot of his movies. He put it in E.T., he put it in this film, he put it in The Fablements. And so I, it's something that I've always connected to with this film. And ultimately, that's the backbone of the movie. And I think this movie, more than anything, is just a, a tragedy and one of the better tragedies I've ever seen. And I love how Spielberg maintains the relationship between Frank Jr. and Frank Sr. Now, in real life, when Frank Jr. ran away from home at age 16, he never saw his father again or his mother. But Spielberg recognized, and Jeff, the screenwriter, recognized that it's crucial for the audience and for Frank Jr., the fictional character to have that emotional connection to family still and his father, his hero in his life. And I love when we go back and see Frank Sr. at different points of the film as Frank is doing his exploits in his teenage years. And every time we see Frank Sr., he's doing worse in life. And, you know, he, he can't accept the car that Frank buys him. He doesn't even know what a chilled fork is or why his fork is freezing cold inside this fancy restaurant, which is a place that he's always wanted to belong to because that shows he's never been a part of the club. He's never been a part of that class or society. You know, he loses the business and he's always trying to make up excuses and con Frank Jr. out of why these things are happening. But I love how we see the sequences of the letters that Frank Jr. is writing to Frank Sr., and I think upon, like, first few watches of this movie, you think that, like, oh, I'm so proud of my son being an airline pilot. This is incredible. Like, he's such a su su successful kid. I'm so happy and proud to be his father. But whenever I watch this movie and I see Frank Sr. reading these letters and seeing his son, 
he knows that his son is conning everything. He knows that it's all BS, but he loves it. And he's proud of him in a lot of ways. He's like, they'll never, and by the last time they talked, he's like, they'll never catch you. You can't stop. You can never he stop. He doesn't want him to stop. He doesn't want, yeah. exactly. He's proud of what he's become. And I think that's a great thing that I, that I, that I pick on personally, pick up on personally is that Frank Sr. knows that everything that Frank Jr. has been telling him has all been a con and that even though he's doing these things, he's not really a pilot. He's not really a doctor. He's you know, not his really 17 a year old son's not a pilot. Exactly. Yeah. So I think it's great. And every time Christopher Watkins read the letters, I'm just like, he knows, he knows he's blind. He knows <laughs> he's full of shit because when Frank impersonated being a substitute teacher in high school, what his father do? He laughed about it. He thought it was great. They both had that incredible grin with the blue eyes, just like spitting images of each other and just enjoying themselves being best buds. And I think Frank senior sees what Frank junior does as, you know, powerful and empowering, taking the government, which has been taken from him instead, and, and taking something back from them. And he's got them in their pocket. He's got the FBI. Pow. He's got the FBI yeah. on the ropes. You know, I love it. Heavyweight champ. <laughs> <laughs> My it, son. To the best pilot in the skies. <laughs> yeah, it's it's really sensational. And Christopher Walken is such a great actor. And I mean. Maybe younger generations don't really know him. He's kind of turned into like a more of a like a someone that's funny. I would say he hasn't done a ton of roles yeah. the last ten years. But like he he has put on some incredible performances, and this is one of them. Uh, my favorite movie that he's done is The Deer Hunter. So good. If you've never seen which it, which is what he won the Oscar for, and it's un, it's an unbelievable performance. He won Best Supporting Actor. Um, and then this film, he does so much, and it gets me very excited for Dune. Obviously. Because he has so much talent and so much potential. Also, The King of New York is a really great Christopher Walken movie. If you haven't seen it, highly recommend checking it out. But the guy is highly talented, and Spielberg cast him perfectly because he actually they they look a lot alike. They him and DiCaprio share a lot of similar face, facial features. Both, Their smiles, yeah, they they have like really the same similar. like very similar mouths too, in uh, facial shapes. Um, also, very tall, and they have like the same hair in a way. And so it's rare that you get to see uh, father, son, or or, or cast or, fi- or actors who are cast as family members to feel physically like they are related, and that's that's a rarity in, in filmmaking. And I mean, just for example, tonight is the finale of Succession, which we're very excited for. It centers upon the three children, three of the children of Logan Roy. Um, he, there are four kids in the movie in the sh- in the show. None of them share any features at all they, they don't look like siblings at all they don't look anything <laughs> like like none of them look related to each other in any way shape or form not a single fa- f- similar feature of a of a nose or a chin or nothing hair it's all different but that doesn't matter because the performers are so great they make you feel like they're related but this, this is an example where the actors do feel physically like they are father and son and that really helps the audience build a connection i think uh, Spielberg, I think he was like, I, I hit lightning with this one because it really is uh, a fantastic casting. Christopher Walken and Leonardo DiCaprio as father and son. And to take, for example, our other lead actor, Tom Hanks, wouldn't have worked as well. I mean, you, he could have played the role of Frank Sr., but it wouldn't have felt quite like it does with Christopher Walken as the father. Plus, Christopher Walken is Christopher yeah. Walken, man. He's he, so, he, he so does, awesome. And he does do plenty of dancing in this movie. <laughs> And one more thing, and then we should get to the intermission and we'll yeah. come back, is the story structure. You know, Spielberg doesn't tell a lot of nonlinear stories, if you think about it, his filmography. And I think it's one of the great strengths of this movie. You know, we, we open up, <laughs> bless you, Anthony, we open up <laughs> early in the film, kind of in Frank Jr.'s, towards the end of his exploits, he's in prison and Carl comes to visit him. Great and, long take. Yeah, it's incredible. But this is like the end of his adventure, basically, for everything he's been taking governments for around the world. And then we're kind of just bouncing back between teenage years and his time with Frank I and mean, with Carl later on when he's being arrested and being hunted. So I love how they play with time in a non- nonlinear structure in this film. I think it's super effective. Agreed. Because and it lets you know it's not going to be a happy ending, like you said. And after the intermission, I want to talk about the actual filmmaking because it's really insane. It's so good. Yeah, we'll talk about why this is just a great yeah. film, just from a production standpoint. Oh, yeah. Big time. Big but before time. we, yeah, big time, guy. Before we continue, though, the best way to support, you hear that Boston accent? And then before we continue, well, I mean, the C's are killing the it right C's, now. Let's go. Okay, well, this will be airing every yeah. after game seven. Yeah. We'll find out. Um, movie, I mean, <laughs> before we continue, the best way to support Raiders of the Lost Podcast 
as you all know, podcast by leaving five star reviews on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, iTunes. Apple Podcasts, you can leave a written review, which we love to read out during the intermission. I'll be doing one in a couple minutes. And also becoming a patron at patreon.com slash Raiders of Lost Podcast is the very best way to financially support the show. It's the reason why we can do the show full time and make the ridiculous amount of content and episodes for you all. Every single week, we have five different tiers of membership. $2, $5, $10, $25, and $100. Every tier, every patron, no matter if you're 2 or 100, gets access to two bonus episodes every single week. The weekly chat has been moved exclusively to Patreon only. You all get to tune into that every Wednesday. Do you have cotton mouth or am I crazy? I'm just talking real fast. As well as... <laughs> yeah, I was in the, I was in, <laughs> in the pipe. In the bowl this morning, kid. And then... <laughs> Did it sound weird? Yeah, it sounds like you have cotton mouth. Yeah, yeah, I had a great leg workout today. And then... <laughs> I shouldn't have said we anything. Also do I, a I weekly, regret it. A weekly bonus episode that every patron has access to. Our $10 tier gets you access to our Discord. It's an incredible film community. $25, you get something cool like a bonus episode that you customize the topic of. You pick a topic, we do it for you. And then $100, you have incredible perks as well, like a custom watch party coming on the show after three weeks. It's so great. Patreon is the reason why the show lives to this day. So thank you to everyone who supports us. We live and breathe through Patreon. <laughs> it's true. <laughs> this show is also sponsored by our longtime friends, MoviePosters.com, the number one place to get your posters online today. Be sure to head on over to their website, MoviePosters.com, and use our promo code Raiders10 to get 10% off your order today. We are also doing a movie poster giveaway in this episode. So if you want to enter for a chance to win a free movie poster from MoviePosters.com, be sure to use head on over to our YouTube channel and make a comment in the Catch Me If You Can episode on YouTube. That will enter you into the contest to win a free movie poster from MoviePosters.com. We will select a winner in one week's time. Good luck, everybody. And in the meantime, head on over to MoviePosters.com and use our promo code RAIDERS10 to get 10% off all of your orders today. Now, let's head into our intermission, Anthony. The ready? intermission guy. The inter I can't get rid of the Boston accent now. Uh, Once you let it out of the box, oh, man. Yeah. Pandora's <laughs> box has been opened. Monkey doesn't go back in the barrel. What? <laughs> it's from Pineapple Express. <laughs> it's a solid oh, yeah. line. <laughs> <laughs> I remember now. It's like reference, bro. <laughs> Movie quote competition time. Ready? Yeah. The weapon is their language. They gave it all to us. Do you understand what that means? Say it again. The weapon is their language. They gave it all to us. Do you understand what that means? Independence Day? Arrival. Oh, nice one. Nice. Here's my quote. <clears throat> Imagine if you suddenly learn that the people, the places, the moments most important to you were not gone, not dead, but worse had never been. What kind of hell would that be? Can we say it one more time? Imagine if you suddenly learned that the people, the places, the moments most important to you were not gone, not dead, but worse had never been. What kind of hell would that be? Ugh. Hmm. Sounds like a Keanu Reeves line. Not Keanu Reeves. I, I, I just played with my voice there. <laughs> I, was, I was just trying to be dramatic. You sounded like John Wick. Yeah, I'm thinking I'm back. <laughs> it's not bad. No, not bad. <laughs> no. I'm thinking I'm back a fifth time. No. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> not exactly. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. I don't know. <laughs> a beautiful mind. Ah. Uh, so one of the, the doctor at the institution is telling Jennifer Connelly's character. I haven't seen that movie in a while, man. We're going to do it soon. We talked about it. Yeah. We're going to do it soon. All right. Guess this movie release here, That's Anthony. an 8.2 on IMDb. That's an awesome movie. It's me all teary-eyed. This is actually a Guess This TV Oh, my God. So, so fun. So what year did Alias premiere on television? 2002. 2001. Uh, I also did a TV one. Oh, nice. What year did Grey's Anatomy premiere? <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. What year did it premiere? 2003? 2005. Oh, man. What a long-running show. 
It's still going. There's also a spinoff, too. <laughs> still going. Now, movie pop quiz time, Anthony. This is a tough one, but I'll I'll accept synopsises of episodes. Now, can you name which episodes of The Office Amy Adams appeared on? Can you guess how many? Booze Cruise. So Booze Cruise is one. That's the only one I can name. But I'm going to, how many she's been in, I'm going to guess she was in five. So three. That was actually the third episode she's in. Before uh-huh. that, the first episode is Hot Girl. She's the hot girl oh, selling yeah, purses yeah. in the conference room. <laughs> and Michael and Jim convinces Dwight to buy a purse. It's a really funny episode. In the fire, where Ryan lights the fire in the Ryan microwave. Ryan started by the fire. So she comes to pick up Jim at the end of that episode because uh-huh. they started dating after Hot Girl. And then Bruins Cruz is the third Bruce episode Cruz. she's mm-hmm. in. So yeah, nice. hey, you got the good one. Well, they're all good. But. Well, I mean, it's the biggest, most prominent role she has is in that one, probably. Yeah. Well, it's a huge episode, too. Yeah, it's an hour-long one. Uh, I think so, yeah. Yeah. It's, it's a, a two-parter. like 40 minutes, yeah. It's a two-parter. Two-parter. <laughs> Booze Cruise Pot 1 and 2. It's a big episode. <laughs> all right. Good job, though. Thanks, man. I'm not... I can't match your office knowledge. I can't do it. Few people can. <laughs> <laughs> you should like make. You should start an office podcast. I mean, a whole other podcast... <laughs> You did it with Hogwarts. Yeah, but it lasted like two months. Yeah, I was like, I'm tired, like, dude. I'm this. exhausted. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> that's true. Okay. Ellen Pompeo starred in which Will Ferrell comedy? Can I look at her face online? You know what Wait, Ellen no. Pompeo looks No, I know what she like? looks like. Okay, yeah. I got it. I got it. Never mind. I got it. What Will Ferrell movie is she in? Oh, she's in old school. Yes. She's the girl from that mixed yeah, dates. Yeah. Yeah. She's the love interest. Nice. Good question. Thanks, man. I didn't think you'd get it. Nailed it. <laughs> I love that movie, dude. I watched that movie way too many times when I was like 14. We watched that a lot. <laughs> it was a regular. Frank the Tank. Once it hits your lips, it's it's, it's so, so good. good. Everyone was quoting that movie for We're a year. We're going drinking up to the quad, through the gymnasium. Snoop, Snoop a loop. <laughs> bring your green hat. You think KFC is still open? <laughs> we should do that. Hey, Mike. I still, hey, Mike. I still quote that. <laughs> <laughs> he fixed up his Thunderbird. Hey, Mike. <laughs> I love uh, in the marriage counseling. He's like, I'm just, I'm just didn't realize that like, I would be stuck having sex with just like one person. <laughs> he's like silently, silently pointing at her. <laughs> no, I've been spawned at the point. He's like, don't do it. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god, this this ridiculous movie it is a ridiculous movie. <laughs> <laughs> All right, what's your stream rec? My stream recommendation... Well, we got to do haters and stuff. Raider haters. Oh, Raider haters. Raider haters, I got some. Sorry, thanks for reminding me. Okay. <clears throat> Nick Patrick wrote, Excited to hear you guys' spoiler take after I watch The Flash, but you guys have teased me, and for that, I must unsubscribe. Next up, we got... Sorry, one second. Sorry, hold on. Hold, please. Hold, please. Hold, please. Hold, please. I can't, where is it? Well, I have a, a, a hater That's review. That's it. That's all of them. Okay. We well, just recorded, so I used them all up the other day. I have a hater review, which is actually... They gave us four stars on Apple Podcasts, but the, the review's a hater review. But, really? Yeah, but I mean, I appreciate the four stars. That's nice. But um, so listen to this one. <laughs> it's, actually, it's actually funny, but... Perfect for children. That's the title. These two millennials are extremely late to the party. All the films they talk about have been covered and done to death, yet they speak about them like they were there first. They were most likely infants. This podcast is proof positive there's no good movie lovers podcast anywhere to be found. I'm sorry. Yeah, I was not born when Star Wars came out. (laughs) Or Chinatown. Whoa. Or The Godfather. Holy crap. Are we not allowed to talk about movies? This is a weird thing that happens on the internet where people get upset, this isn't the first time, that you talk about movies that came out before you were born. Which is so odd to yeah, me. Yeah, we get comments past. sometimes, yeah. I mean, we love we love doing new movies and relevant things, but we love old cinema, and that's one of the main points of the podcast is to appreciate cinema as a whole. I mean, it's been around for over 100 years, and, and talk about movies we grew up watching and loving. I mean, I'm sorry. We love The Godfather, and we're going to talk the fucking shit out of The Godfather if we want to. Also, but- I mean, it sounds like they just don't like anything. I appreciate the four stars, but yeah, like four stars. I mean, but this is a weird thing. I've seen it a lot. No, of yeah, our, yeah. Our, our, we get a lot of comments about it, like, oh, you guys are. This movie came out 25 years ago. Why are you talking about? It? Because we want to talk about it. Yeah. We love it. This that's the thing is 
Hmm. It's it's this weird opinion where because you're talking about an old movie, it doesn't mean you love movies. It, it's so odd to me. Just that last line, proof positive there's no good movie lovers podcast anywhere to be found. Find me another podcast that covered Chinatown. Zero. <laughs> Find me one. I'm sure there's a couple, maybe, but we just did it two we weeks just, ago. Oh, find me a podcast that, that did Chinatown, There Will Be Blood, and Children of Men in one month. Th- find me that. <laughs> That's Cinema Lovers Podcast yeah. right there. Are you freaking kidding me? Yeah. I, but, mean, I mean, at least it wasn't a one-star review. So but I, no, I, yeah. I was, the, the, oh, it sounds like they're an older person. and uh, So I made that TikTok about in, uh, seeing Inglorious Bastards at the New Bev. Yeah. And I, I, was, I talked about the New Bev and how they played old movies and how I loved... Like, I can't wait to see these movies from the 60s and 70s there that are coming out in June. And someone commented, were you even alive in the 70s? Who cares? <laughs> what the hell kind of comment is that? So you can't watch the movie? I'm not allowed to watch? It's so odd. Yeah. I, I've, I used to see it a lot more where people, like, get upset that you watch movies from before you were born or you were alive. Like, you're not allowed to, like, you're not allowed to talk about a movie that was made before 1990. Or, I mean, it's not like I, I was alive and saw good, well, not like I saw Goodfellas when I was one. A baby in 1990, but it's it's so weird to me. Like it is that odd. opinion it's where you, you can't talk about movies from before your life. Well, I mean, at least they didn't bring our rating down too much with the four what, stars. What you, how are you supposed to do anything like any arts? What you, if you so, t- well, according to them, you I can't mean, listen to Led Zeppelin. Yeah. <laughs> I, I can't go to a museum and look at art. You definitely can't talk about Led Zeppelin because it's been spoken about too many times. And I can, it's been overdone. And I can only go to modern art museums. <laughs> <laughs> it's so odd. Why man. does this person even listen to podcasts? Why even? It sounds like. You, well, I mean, at least they didn't give us a one star. That's true. They still did the four stars, which which is better than the one stars. But still, I mean, that opinion is so odd to me. Where you're not allowed to talk about or watch films from before you were born. Yeah, it sounds like they're very unhappy. I Whatever. Mean, Anyways, I got I got I got rate unsubscribe. Let's move on. I mean, just, we can't talk about this all day. Why not? People, are, they're, they're just chilling, bro. They're on, they're at the gym right now. <laughs> Anthony's trying to rush this off, everybody. Rush. It's been five minutes about this guy. It's, it's, it was a good rant. <laughs> Anyways, the t- this is a good one. The Titan Gen wrote in non spoiler section talks about how the, the non spoiler section talks about how Barry Allen needs a lot of calories in the movie. That's a big spoiler. Unsubscribed. <laughs> Oh, <laughs> <laughs> you, you didn't know it was on your face. I was like, "You're like, are you fucking kidding?" No, but at the same time, I was like, "That's not they do that in every Flash movie in Batman vs Superman." Yeah, it's, it went over your head. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Jk, love you guys. Thanks for the multiple spoiler warnings. I will come back to this video after I see the movie. Keep up the good work. I oh, appreciate you. Thanks so much. Thanks, pal. Yeah. So I, <laughs> and there was a lot of confusion of why we also did our episode like that for the Flash, where we did the first 15 minutes spoiler free. We took a break and then we did our spoiler version because we want people to go back and check out. Yeah. It from the, so we don't we don't have two episodes to confuse people. Just one source for both. Yeah, I mean, yeah, it's, I thought it was a good idea. <laughs> <laughs> did good numbers on YouTube. What's your streaming recommendation for today? It is a messed up Japanese horror movie oh, called nice. Audition. Now this is available online through Amazon. You can rent it with subscriptions through Fandor. Or Screenbox. Now, it only costs about. It's one of those free trials that you can just delete after like a day. But I if you re- remember, yeah, if you remember. But I highly recommend watching this movie if you can. I mean, there's all those free sites out there that you can check out as well. Movie Seven dot two. Movie Seven dot to. Um, but Audition is an incredible horror movie. It's been on my watch list for a while. Anthony reminded me about it the other day, and it's so freaking messed up. In the third act, I was watching parts through my fingers. And I loved it at the same time. It was tremendous. It came out in 1999. Yeah, it's, I feel like every two weeks the past, like, four months, I've been like, have you watched Audition yet? You gotta watch Audition. It was great. Finally did it. What do you got? I have The Covenant. Guy Ritchie's The Covenant. Uh, it's only available for rental, but it's only, like, five bucks on Amazon. It's really good. It, it hits that war movie itch that I get every once in a while. And it's just a solid action movie. Also, it's kind of an anti, anti-war movie and has some really cool things to say about um the 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 war in the, the middle complication east. the complicated complex war of the middle east and its effect in aftermaths and i thought it was really really fucking awesome and jake gyllenhaal was great in it yeah a it was, lot of it's it, great you get the perspective of afghan citizens yeah and civilians that live there yeah and so i, I think that was a refreshing take on the war in the middle east and occupation of those countries and, and the, the title credit the uh the end credits photo montage 
was great. I yeah. loved it. It's based on a true story. Yeah. About interpreters mm-hmm. that are from whether it's whether wherever countries, like for example, in Afghanistan, this country in this movie, and they're working for the American military, which is occupying their country yeah. and why they do it and the things they go through. It's really terrific, uh, heartbreaking, but also Guy Ritchie's. I, I call him old reliable. He's just such a reliable director. He makes like a movie a year. They're always solid. You know what you're getting, and it's got some freaking awesome action sequences. Yeah, and I, I can't think of um, Jake Gyllenhaal doing action like this before. I mean, with with like assault rifles and weaponry like that, not really many times. I mean, the only thing I he think killed was it, Prince of Persia with the swords, but like in terms of gunfire, I haven't Jarhead, seen Jarhead, but he never fires his never gun. fires his gun. Yeah. People say that, but it's like he never shoots his weapon. Yeah, and it's one of the main Jarhead. themes of the film. Yeah, so it doesn't count. Good point. So I think it suited him well. So I'm looking forward to him um, hitting more action in the future. But it's an awesome movie, and yeah. it's in my top six right now. It was on my top ten. I put it, I think at number six of the year so I'll far. I put it in my top ten of the year. It's pretty good, but I mean, by the end of the year, it'll probably get kicked out. We got some bangers coming up, but let's get back into Catch Me If You Can. Now, something I want to touch on is the filmmaking and directing, most specifically the blocking of scenes in cinematography. And we've said it many times before, Steven Spielberg is, in my opinion, the greatest blocker of scenes in film history. Now, explain blocking for some viewers who don't know what it is. Blocking is how the camera and actors interact, basically, and how scenes are played out. And, you know, you have a room. Where are you going to put the actors? And if action is happening, how are they going to move through the room? Where are they going to go? And where is the camera in relation to all this? Now, most of the time, generally, filmmakers will set up a bunch of shots, and they'll do just different camera angles. Spielberg does that plenty of times, but... Something that he does remarkably well and probably better than anyone in history is he actually prefers to do uh, long takes. Now, it's not going to be a long take like that gets a lot of media attention or press. And it's not going to be like, a, you know, Children of Men or like Boogie Nights or like six minute long takes, four minute long takes. His or wonders is another way to call them. He likes to do like 30 second long takes or like 45 second wonders where it's not exactly going to get so much attention from people who watch the movie, but it is an incredible way to portray his scenes. And all of his movies are full of these. And they're, they're scenes that the scene will be 30 seconds or a minute long, but he just films it with one shot. And in this film, he does it a lot. He does a lot of handheld camera work. And two of my favorite shots are actually in the opening of the movie. It's two shots at the prison. So the first shot where Hanratty is entering the French prison to visit Frank in in his cell. What happens is Spielberg and Janusz Kaminski, his cinematographer, they start the shot looking through the door hole, like this little the circular window in the in the door, and we see Tom Hanks. Then the door opens, never cuts. We just turn and we follow Tom Hanks down the hallway, and the guard tells him, "You sit here. You don't give him anything, to, anything to the hole. You don't open that door." And then we lead that actor as he walks back down the hall again. It's all one take, and then we cut to just a very simple shot, reverse shot of DiCaprio and Hanks, and that's it for the entire scene. And then my favorite shot in the movie is the next scene in which Frank escapes the hospital bay of the prison and so after he had his coughing fit and collapsed uh this next long take starts in the hallway again where the guards are dragging the uh dragging frank down the hallway handwriting's yelling at them to get a doctor get a doctor here then we follow the crew the casting crew into the hospital area they set him down onto the hospital bed close the curtain and then we follow the actors as they go to the sinks to wash their hands because of the lice. And then Hanratty's berating the men for not getting a doctor there soon enough. And then one, the, the leader of the men is like, hey, this is how we do things here. Like, whatever, the doctor will be here tomorrow morning. And then they hear something and they look and the door nearby is ajar. And then the man goes over to the curtain, opens the curtain. Frank's not in the bed anymore. Then the men run out of the room. And then Hanrahan smiles. Han Ray smiles. <laughs> and he goes, "Ah, oh, Frank, it's all one take, and it's about forty-five seconds, but it's so much better than doing a bunch of setups. Doing it, we don't need to have a camera angle for every character who speaks. You don't need to do a twelve-camera setup. 
sometimes it's just easier, faster, more streamlined, and just so much more engaging with doing these uh, one takes, long takes. And they, like I said, they're not very long, but they still are so much, they are still quite long compared to the average cut. The average cut in a Spielberg movie is way longer than any other movie I can think of. And then an another one that's just very simple. It's not exactly that long, but it's just the way that Spielberg likes to shoot his scenes. He likes to use the camera, one camera as long as much as he can. He does not like to edit between a lot of takes. He doesn't like to edit between wide, medium, close up. And so the Rotary Club scene, there's this beautiful shot. It's my third favorite shot in the movie. And Frank Sr. Um, and then um, Frank's mom and then Frank Jr. sitting at the table. And what Spielberg and Janif do, Janif do is they... Um, the camera starts, we're on the floor of the ballroom beside Frank Sr., but the camera's on Frank, on Jack, who's speaking at the podium. And then the camera does this really wonderful um, tracking around the table. So we go from Jack, and then we track around, and then we see get a shot of Frank Sr., and we track around, we get a shot of Frank's mom, and then we keep tracking, and then we get a shot of, then we see Frank Jr., and then we get the whole thing framed together. It's all one take. It's only 15 seconds. But any other director would have just done edit, 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 a shot for each actor. But Spielberg's like, no, I'm just going to do one camera move and I'm going to reveal the entire family this way. And it's so much more interesting. And also, I'm sorry. <laughs> no, you're good. Keep, go, keep going, man. There's amazing transitions in this movie. One of my favorite transitions, and it's not something I picked up on until I saw the film multiple times, but so when Frank's failure when frank fails to escape the prison and he's he collapses onto the floor and all the prisoners are like cheering and then the the guards and hand ready come to that big walkway um frank is lying on his back out of breath and coughing and then the camera goes bird's eye from up above on the ceiling looking down on frank but it also starts rotating and we rotate and we cut to the rotary club and we get the wheel of the rotary club so he's really and you hear them saying uh, the dialogue from Jack giving his his presentation at the podium, saying the Rotary Club as the camera is rotating, which is just fucking genius. Pretty good stuff, man. Yeah, I think maybe my, one of my favorite sequences of great blocking in cinematography, which is just tremendous. Every shot in this movie is magnificent, but there's a great shot of when Frank has finally figured out what he needs to do to get reputability to cash checks, and that's by impersonating and an airline pilot and he gets the uniform and now finally the banks are accepting his checks where he was getting turned down constantly over and over again and he's done it a few times and then there's that great shot of you know the first time he takes the sticker off the model plane puts it on then the next shot is like 20 of those little model planes in the bathtub after there was just one before and he's walking through the bank and he feels like he's done this a hundred times now and he's just looking at each of the tellers, each of the tellers. And it's a great tracking long lens shot yeah. from pretty far away. And it's cutting between him looking at the tellers and then him looking and gazing, cutting back and forth until he finds Elizabeth Elizabeth Banks. He's like, that's my target right there. Mm -hmm. I think it's just an incredible scene and an incredible blocking of how would a director film this? How, how would a filmmaker do this? I think Spielberg is just so creative in the movie that you don't think there's a lot of creativity in this film because it's not a science fiction, massive movie like half his filmography, but there's a ton of creativity in the filmmaking. And my favorite shot in this movie is probably a close-up. So many tremendous close-ups in this movie, especially because we're dealing with a lot of typing, papers, yeah. and checks. And I, I love yeah. like the shot where he's he's doing the quadruple lettering on the check to make yeah. it seem more legit, like it was like stamped by a big press, which is why he's constantly doing the the same letter and over and over again. He's like our backspace, our our backspace, our backspace on that one sequence, so that it looks more like a a payroll check. Mm -hmm. But the shot of, I think it was continued after that sequence, or the first time he cashes a check so it's successfully. It's, it's not when it's cashed, it's, it's alluding to what he wants. It's his first time he goes to the banks. It opens with the money. Okay, yeah, yeah. And then it cuts to him getting interviewed and failing. Gotcha. But I'm talking about my favorite yeah. shot is when he's successful. Okay, so he's going to the bank, and there's a close-up of a teller counting money and counting cash. And what Spielberg does with this shot is, is just a close-up of the bills, the center of the bills, to see the bust of either the president or 
famous American on the dollar bill to let you know what bill it is. We don't have to, he doesn't show the number or what kind of bill it is. He doesn't show that it's a five, a 10, a 20. He just shows the president or person on the bill and there's two of each. It goes through the, the, the fives, the tens, the twenties, and then all the way up to hundreds. And it's a brilliant shot. And I think it's just such a creative way to show how much money is being counted or just counting money in general. Yeah, that's a shot um, we talked about this morning because I watched it last night and I thought the same thing. And I was like, I was like, how did they film that? Because it looks like it's very simple, but you get to factor in when you count when you when you're placing money down, your your hand's gonna be there in the shot, and also each one's placed perfectly. And so, how do they get it so it's the heads perfectly line up from head to head to head every time a new bill is placed down? And then how do you avoid showing someone's thumb or fingers or hand or whatever? And I was thinking maybe they must have used um, like thick paper or something. No, not just that, but um, some kind of uh, automated machine to do it. Yeah, maybe. Like a, a, like a card counter, like a money counter. And they, they must have just figured something out to make it so that the, the dollars would – the bills would fall down in place perfectly without having to worry about someone's hand. It's great. It's simple, but it's. it's I like, think it's my favorite shot in the whole movie. I kept thinking about it this morning. I was like, when I started this morning, be- I'm like, I'm like, dude, I think the best shot in that movie last night because I watched it again last night too. I think it's the money counting. <laughs> and, uh, and I was like, yeah, I was trying to figure out how they did that. <laughs> and another shot that I love is his first time deadheading. <laughs> Are you my deadhead? <laughs> first of all, I love when the when she asks him, "Would you like a drink after takeoff?" milk <laughs> so funny um but after the after the takeoff and um she's uh, uh preparing cart service in like the little uh, alleyway and frank walks by she's like are you enjoying your free ride and so uh, this is another long take again it's only 30 seconds maybe 20 maybe less maybe like 20 seconds but it's so it's so great just doing it in one take it's just a wide and it looks just like i think it's like a 50 mil lens and Frank walks past her, and then he comes into the foreground of the lens, and he holds out his hand, and the necklace falls. Marcy. And the, and, but it's a really complicated camera. The entire the camera doesn't really move, but the, the shot is complicated for focusing because he's in focus in, in the background, and then, but when he comes into the foreground, he's out of focus, and she's still in focus, but then they, they rack focus onto the onto the close-up of Leo's hand and the necklace falling, and then that becomes in focus while she's out of focus in the background. It's a really complicated shot. And then does it cut to when he puts it around her it neck? It cuts to, yeah, for putting, him putting it around her neck. Um, it's just really amazing, simple um, camera work, but it, it's just, it's... Like, when I watch Spielberg movies, I'm like, of course that's how you do it. I mean, that's fucking genius. <laughs> <laughs> it's just like such... It looks like it's trivial... And it just, like I think to the untrained eye, it doesn't look like anything special. But when I watch his movies, I'm always like, "How the fuck did he figure that out?" Like that's so <laughs> it's so fu- it's like the best way to shoot that scene is how he does it every single time. You know what I mean? Yeah. It's like there's a way to shoot the scene, and then there's like the best possible way to shoot a scene, and he always does the latter because he's he's one of the goats, man. And another great production element to this film that makes it really special is John Williams' score, where he got an Oscar nomination. It's one of my favorites he's ever done, and it's kind of hard to find. You can't really find the full it's album impossible. anywhere. impossible. It's on YouTube. I've, I've The full album's somewhere on YouTube, but you can't... I think you can buy it maybe on iTunes, maybe, but you can't really listen to the full thing on Spotify or anything like that. You have like to that. buy it from John Williams. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you have to go to his house. He sells it in his garage. Yeah, on, on Saturday mornings, John Williams has a couple boxes of, of CDs of, of Catch Me If You Can. But it's just one of those scores where it's just like, where the fuck can I listen to this thing? It's the only one that I have trouble finding. And I wonder if it's because maybe because DreamWorks owns it. Maybe it's very special to him. He doesn't really want it out there publicly like everything else. But it's just one of those scores that it just takes this film to a new level. It's so unique. It's terrific. It's complex. It's whimsical. It's fun. It it adds so much energy to the story. And it kind of serves for me – as basically a constant character piece for Frank Jr. for pretty much the whole film. Well, the 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 one of the themes is Frank's, but the no 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 no, that's Hanratty's theme. No 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 no. That only or just him being chased. I guess, yeah, yeah. It, it's only the dun 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 dun. That's yeah, yeah. Frank's theme. Mm-hmm. But then dun 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 dun. That's Hanratty's theme. 
and also the FBI theme. So the authority theme. And you only really hear that when handwriting is showing up or when authorities are, are on the tail. It's like the hunt. The exactly. The hunt. All right. And it's one of my favorite John Williams themes. I think it's absolutely genius in its simplicity and its overarching um, way of progressing into every piece of music. And uh, it's just an iconic part of the movie, but you don't hear it until about 30 minutes into the film. After the opening credits, obviously. It's it's all over the opening credits, but then we don't hear until handwriting starts showing up because it is his theme, and Frank's theme is more um, playful. Uh, it's more hopeful in a way. It's almost magical. Yeah. yeah, all that stuff. But then I love. It's just and also saxophone is the main instrument that um, he used aside from the xylophones, obviously. But he does a lot of solo saxophone writing in this film, and it's just really incredible to behold the jazz themes, the jazz style. Uh, John Williams began his career as a jazz pianist, so this was kind of like um, who he really began as in terms of what kind of musician he is, which is why his music's always been so complex and so hard to duplicate. Uh, but he began in jazz, so it's really cool to see him go back to his roots with this movie. Well, and then, I mean, he did jazz two years later with Prisoner of Azkaban, which yeah. is really cool. That, that's a very jazzy score. And you say that every single time? Every single time? <laughs> yeah. Well, it was relevant, asshole. <laughs> asshole. <laughs> Anyways, <laughs> let's talk about Carl Hanratty. 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 I am Carl Hanratty. You wallet. <laughs> <laughs> Your wallet. <laughs> we were on a plane a few uh, a few weeks ago, and we were referencing Han Raddy in our seats. And then the guy next, it, it, yeah. Car- Catch Me If You Can was on the, the was VOD. On the, yeah. And then the guy next to me was like, "You guys talking about Catch Me If You Can?" I was like, "Yeah." <laughs> we, were, we, were like, we were like, "You're cool, man." We were doing that whole scene where Carl <laughs> and and Frank meet each other for the first time, and it's incredible. Frank Carl Han Raddy, it's a great character, and an atypical kind of investigator or antithesis to our protagonist with a like a great scheme like someone hunting a con man it's just fun you know what it reminds me of i think that bong joon ho got takes took a lot of inspiration for this for his films especially memories of murder yeah maybe where the the investigators are kind of boneheads yeah kind of silly yeah even though you know they their hearts are in the right intentions yeah they want to do well they are silly and and dutz is just like carl hanrad he's a dutz in this movie (laughs) i love when he he's going through the hotel and he scares the woman he's like don't worry ma'am fbi he holds it backwards (laughs) he's got a gun out (laughs) because he's a good investigator but he's a dutz he lets frank get away multiple times like you, like you say, he shows the wrong side of the badge. I feel like he's better as a desk jockey yeah. than a in, in the field kind of guy. He's a joke at the FBI. They make fun of him. They don't take him seriously. He has that scene with the pink laundry from that woman's <laughs> red shirts. And, I mean, no one takes check fraud seriously at the FBI yet. It really hasn't become a serious crime, you could say, that unit. He could be unit chief someday, but... His superior warns him, like, don't you like you don't want to make a fool of yourself if you want to keep hunting this guy and this person. Like, no one cares about check fraud. Like, big deal, whatever. A couple, what, a couple checks went floating around the country. It's not that big of a deal. But Carl is the only one who understands the ramifications of what's going on and how big of a deal this is. That these checks are being flown away all over the country, and there's no way of tracing them for weeks of where they were written, who cashed them. And this person's just stealing millions of dollars from banks, from hotels, from the U.S. government. I also learned how checks work because of this movie. <laughs> yeah, <me too. laughs> it's a great presentation. It's an excellent presentation. But but Hanratty's hilarious, and and I, I I love Tom Hanks, and you know this character I think is is one of his most underrated for sure. It's because it's a supporting role. Yeah, but there's something about it that it, it just works. It just adds to the story. It adds so much charm. And well, he, he's he is an old reliable Tom Hanks. Yeah, you know, and Spielberg was actually hesitant about asking him to do the film because it wasn't a lead role because Tom Hanks was on top of Hollywood at this point in his career. He had ten movies in a row make a hundred million dollars. That's fucking huge deal, and they're all. You know, critically acclaimed or well loved, so he was probably the number one actor in Hollywood at at this point in, in his life. And so, even though they had worked together, he wasn't sure Hanks would want to do a smaller role like this. But Hanks said, "A good role is a good role." So obviously, I mean, he it, he saw the potential of this character, even though he was, you know, he didn't even he doesn't even show up until what. 
35 minutes into the film. It's quite a little bit. Yeah, so it's it, it, he, it's like, I think it's a testament to him being like, you know what, I care more about how great of a film I'm making as opposed to do I need to be the lead actor and do I need to be on screen the whole time? Do I need to be the, the cover of the poster? So he is on the cover. Of the, he's on the I mean, poster. Well, okay. It's got right. a great poster. The design. I love the I love poster. It's great. Yeah. There's a couple different Which variations. I like the one with them running. They're both running in opposite directions. Yeah, yeah. yeah. The blue the arrows. Blurry. It's yeah, really cool. It's fantastic. And then him, him and DiCaprio, and the the few scenes they do share together are just dynamite together. Excellent chemistry. Um, I really, I, I hope that DiCaprio makes another movie with Spielberg, because Hanks is, Hanks made plenty with Spielberg, but. I think he's really suited to Spielberg's directing style. And I would love to see them collaborate again. And they only did this one, Just right? this yeah. one. He also, I, I mean, DiCaprio went from Scorsese with Gangs in New York to Spielberg, don't catch, and catch me if you can. It's like, that's absurd. And then Tarantino. Yeah, it's <laughs> wild, man. It's unbelievable. Now, Carl Hanratty is loosely based off a real FBI agent who was anonymous and left anonymous by Abagnale in the book that he wrote back in 1977, but eventually it came out that his name was Joseph Shea. But Carl Hanratty is also an embodiment of multiple people that were tracking Frank throughout his exploits of all of his cons throughout the course of those years that he was doing it, but loosely based off that one character. And like going back to the scenes that you're talking about with Frank and Carl and how great their chemistry was. I, I love every moment they share on screen together. And that scene that the, the first time they officially meet chronologically at that apartment motel. It's so funny and exciting. And, and I still quote it. We, like, your wallet. It's, it's just your a wallet. blast. And it shows everything about this guy, Han Ratty, who's kind of like, he's like a Boy Scout, but just like kind of a goofball. And not aloof, but just has bad luck. And he can't always see things that are staring him right in the face unless it's something paper trail-wise. Then he can see it. But he can't see a con in front of his face if it's happening to him because that's how Frank gets away. He even tells him on the phone, like I said earlier, people tell you what people— How, how'd people, you know I wouldn't look in your wallet? People believe what only people only believe what you tell them. Same way the Yankees—people can't stop, take their eyes off the Yankees' pinstripes, basically. And so— I think they have a great chemistry. They're a great relationship, and I love how the story ends where they eventually start working together at the FBI, which is still loosely based in fact or fiction is kind of up for debate completely. Mm -hmm. There's still a little bit of ambiguity of how much time he actually spent working at really? the FBI in terms of Frank. Really? But he still is obviously very successful when it comes to check fraud uh -huh. and, and security for mm -hmm. banks and everything like and that. And helping design checks. For Although, sure. I mean, he's kind of out of business now. Who uses checks anymore? I know. <laughs> it's interesting. Um, you can see, the, in a way, the how technology can become obsolete when you watch movies, uh, period pieces like this, where this was state-of-the-art, what Frank was doing. And, he, I mean, check fraud at that time, it was like – it was the highest form of technology in terms of the monetary system and economics – and nowadays it would be it's like laughable to think that people paid every bill with a check or even paid like for things like a hotel room with a check yeah it's 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 silly to think about but that was the way the world worked so unreliable yeah <laughs> yeah and that was the way everything worked back then whereas now everything is instant everything is digitized and we are getting more into that way where eventually every everything will be digitized and you won't even need to be. You won't even ever have to carry money around, or even. I mean, coins. so many places don't even take cash anymore. Exactly. Yeah. Restaurants and bars and, and yeah. stores. Eventually, like, that will become the norm where there just won't be <laughs> physical dollars. Pretty weird. But I can't remember the last time I wrote a check. It's been a long time for me. But personally. we used to do it. We used to do it in our early twenties. Yeah. Writing checks yeah. was pretty common. Still paying the rent with pay, the check. Pay the rent with the check. We would put in the now in the envelope. Sell. <laughs> <laughs> now it's sell. It's so weird. But you could also argue at the same time that whatever era Frank Abagnale Jr. grew up in, he would have used the technology to his advantage. And he probably would have used modern technology if he grew up in this era to make even more money and con tens of millions out he of He would have made a crypto coin. Probably. <laughs> probably. <laughs> Frank coin. Frank coin. <laughs> <laughs> and I think the the relationship between him and Carl Hanratty is really important because it shows the passage of time in this film really well because they're always talking on Christmas. Christmas. We're always talking on Christmas. You got no one else to call. <laughs> You got no one else to call. And by the time he's being arrested in France, it's Christmas. Carl, it's Christmas. 
So every time we have Christmas, obviously we have a year passing, but it's a great, great way for the audience to know how much time is passing throughout the film. This movie also kind of reminds me of The Departed. Yeah, kid. The uh, the cutting from from Colin to um, Bill is kind of like the the cutting from Han Ready to Frank for a little bit. Yeah, especially for like um, for example when when Colin and when Matt Damon and Vera Farmiga's character are getting together, and it cuts then it cuts to Bill Costigan and Hustle getting the cast, and he clearly likes the 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 doc the female doctor who's doing his cast. But rather than saying anything to her, he just stays quiet. So he's not having any kind of intimate relationships with anyone. And something similar happens where when DiCaprio has a scene with Jennifer Garner and it's very sexual, very intimate, it cuts to Han Ratty in the laundromat and his clothing gets dyed pink. And it's kind of like cutting from person to person to see how their lives are progressing and what's lacking and what's going well for one and the other. That's a great point. I, I, I think that's a excellent assessment. Whoa, you think so? I think so. Thanks, man. And there, there are so many great moments of, of excellent montages of Frank Jr.'s rise of success rise. of conning. <laughs> and, you know, starting with just doing the checks and then eventually becoming an airline pilot, a deadhead, a, a co-pilot. It's a really then... ingenious way because the way... At first, he was having no luck. And then when he sees the airline pilot in public getting so much attention and being able to walk in at, into the fantasy hotel and being greeted by the manager of the hotel. Right away, he was like, whoa, there's something special about them. And also, the, he, Spielberg and Kaczynski had, like, uh, Kaminsky, they had, like, this w- warm golden light shine on DiCaprio <laughs> right when he saw the pilot as, like, it was, like, the, the gates of heaven opening up to him. And then his plan is pretty ingenious where he he begins learning everything he can about Pan Am and Pan Am pilots, and then he... He manages to get himself a uh, uniform from the lost from the lost uniform whatever department of Pan Am. No, it's not lost uniform. No, I'm not department. lost, but it's like, just a uniform. Yeah, so you, they make their uniforms. Yeah, because he he says he lost. Is this the, the lost and found. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I meant. And then, but then he manages to get a new get fit for a uniform, and then he's already on his way to convincing people that he is a pilot. From the looks, from appearances, going back to Frank Sr., it's all about appearances, but then also being able to forge checks with the Pan Am logo that he's taking off of the little toy airplanes, model airplanes. And so it's actually really an ingenious plan that he had for fooling the system, whether it be fooling people or fooling banks. And what he did is not possible now, obviously, with technology. You could never (laughs) – it just doesn't work like this anymore. But back then – What's interesting was how loose it was in terms of uh, banks, how you could just walk into a bank with a check, if, especially if it was a payroll check, and just cash it. You didn't have to be part of that bank or anything. Like, he's just walking with payroll checks. If you Pan- have a reputation. For, yeah, from like Pan Am. Like being a pilot. Yeah, from Pan Am, and they're cashing it. And that's what's so interesting about this film, because it was kind of like a Wild West, and it was silly not to try to take advantage of it in his eyes. Yeah, it's it's a really great plan, and... He he does that for everything he cons. I mean, with the checks, he learns everything he can about checks and routing numbers and how banks tell a difference and what kind of printers they use after he starts dating Elizabeth Banks' character. That mm-hmm. was part of the target, not just to get cash from her for cashing checks, but also to learn more about banks and checks and how to make fraudulent checks that could pass and kind of almost have to become a point where he's making real checks. And that's that, where, he, after that, he gets the the check printer. Yeah. The specific one for making his own checks more and realistic. Just like when he's a doctor, he doesn't really do a lot of research for being a doctor. He watches some movies, but I mean, he just passes it off and uses comedy and confidence to just pass off everything that's being asked of him as being a doctor at the hospital. I love the the the, the uh, courthouse scene where <laughs> the he, lawyer he's acting like it's son, a trial. What in the hell is wrong with you? There is no jury. <laughs> there is no plaintiff. <laughs> what in the hell is wrong with you? But he did study for two weeks, and he passed the bar in Louisiana. How'd you do it, Frank? How'd you pass the bar in Louisiana? <laughs> you give me the hours there. Have clear, I'll tell you. <laughs> <laughs> and he actually something that is true is he actually did escape that plane yeah so he actually did it through <laughs> the kitchen the kitchen department yeah area. But i love no. that scene it's a it's one of my favorite cuts because uh they can't open the bathroom door and like where could he have gone and so, and then uh the the larger agent br- busts through the door 
and then Hanrahan gets inside, and it's empty. And he's like, "What the fuck? <laughs> where the fuck did he go?" It's great. I mean, I it's, love it. It's just a great character trait to Frank, where he can't stop. He can't. He can't yeah. stop. Even at the end of the film, he has a printing press making checks. He just he can't stop conning. Well, that's why I think I think that's why Spielberg opened the film with him trying to escape the French prison, so we can understand immediately who this character is and what he does. He just tries to. He's always trying to run. He's always trying to escape. And I think that's why he specifically chose that as the opening of the movie. I think it's a good point. Another one. He can't help himself. Just Another. like his father can't help himself from conning as well. Even trying to con his own son of his bad although, fortune. Although he ends up, he gives up when he sees his mother with the new family. And then he asks uh, Hanratty to take him in. He says, take me in, take me in. And then also, in a way... I suppose Frank, in a way, was always motivi- motivated by the chase. And there's that great scene after he's been working for the FBI for some time and he hates it and he wants to escape. And then Hanratty follows him to the airport. And again, this is another long take. It's, it's just one shot, this entire, through the airport tunnel with Frank and Hanratty. It's all just one shot and it's really fantastic. But essentially what they get down to is that Henry is going to let him go. I'm going to let you fly tonight, Frank. And he says, why are you going to let me go? He says, look, nobody's chasing you. What do you run? There's nothing to run from anymore for, for Frank. There's nothing to run away from. And so there's really no reason to, to run. And I think that Henry understood that at that point in the story. And there is you know, a point in Frank's life where I think he was telling the truth a little bit. I think his love for Brenda was the most true thing he said in the entire film, really, where he's talking to Brenda's father, the lawyer, played by Martin Sheen. He's asking, he lies about so many things, lies about going to Berkeley, lies about being a Lutheran. You're not a Lutheran! (laughs) (laughs) And, and, (laughs) (laughs) and, uh, her, her, her father's basically saying, like, tell me the truth, like, who are you really? He's not asking, like, are you a comment? But, yeah, but, Frank just says, to be honest, I'm none of those things. He's telling the truth here. I'm not a lawyer. I'm not a doctor. I'm not an airline pilot. I'm just a kid who's in love with your daughter. I think that's the only true statement that's really said by Frank this entire time of him exploring. I think he loved Brenda. Yeah, he and did. because he did he want, wanted, he, he did want, want to her life. Yeah, he did want to run away for, with her, and she did turn him, try to turn him in. Well, he wanted yeah. to start a life there. Yeah. He wanted to stay in Louisiana and try to settle down, which Frank really tried to do, not with, in in Louisiana in real life, but he, he tried to settle down with Brenda and be a lawyer. Yeah. It was never. He didn't figure. He didn't think that. You know what? If they get on my tail, he can't change his name. He changed his name. He he, he can't. He get. He can't get he, the girl. He loses the girl. He loses the girl. <laughs> <laughs> lose the name. He loses the girl. <laughs> <laughs> so his love for Brenda is really like the only truth in the whole movie. Yeah, I agree. And Amy Adams is great. She was in two movies at this point in her career in the early 2000s where she just fucking uh, dominated the screen. She's just a real c- scene stealer. Ricky Bobby. Remember her in Talladega Nights? In, in the second half oh of the movie? Oh my God, you're right. Yeah, That's yeah. Amy Adams, That's right. the, like, the assistant, yeah. who's like very passionate and just like she pep talks him back into getting back into the... And into racing, she just like explodes on the screen in that movie, and then in this film too, she just steals every scene. She's got you. You can see how talented she is in this early role of her. She's so young, but she's still just to hold her own in on screen opposite the most famous actor alive, working for the most famous director alive. I'm sure that's a daunting task, but she was absolutely dynamite in this movie. And she's really just phenomenal in the role. And I, I adore her. Talladega Nights was 2006. Wow, that's an yeah. old movie. Holy yeah. crap. Yeah, it's old, man. Yeah, because she was just doing a bunch of... T- she was doing TV. She was doing smaller roles in a ton of movies. I mean, she didn't really have her... She didn't pop until Ella this, Enchanted. this time. Yeah. yeah, Ella Enchanted popped her. Like, made her... Catch Me If You Can. I mean, The Office in 2005. Yeah, wow. Tenacious D in 2006. Took her a while to get really going. I believe it was Ella Enchanted was her big one. Well, I, but and, also and critical acclaim. I think Charlie Wilson's War, but then also Doubt in two thousand and eight was a huge yeah. role for her because oh, yeah. I think she got, got an nominated. Oscar nom, then yeah, Julie and Julia, and then she just became one of the best actors actresses on the planet after that. Mm. I mean, so many great roles. But wow, that's right. That's a good point. Talladega Nights. 
<laughs> There's so many great sequences that we haven't even brought up. You know, I, I love the the James Bond of the sky sequence where he gets the same suit, he gets the same car, he pretends he's James Bond. The sequence, the scene with Jennifer Garner's character. Wow, what a what a crush I had on Jennifer Garner when I saw this movie. <laughs> Goodness gracious, and I, I think that's a great sequence as well. She I, played like a, a model actress. Yeah, um, she's on the cover she's, of Seventeen. She yeah. said a few years ago. Mm-hmm. He so, says uh, all the all the boys had her photo on on their lockers. Yeah, she's probably like a pop star. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And then also, I love the the sequence where Hanratty figures out Barry Allen is is a name of a comic book. I character. I didn't even know who the Flash was the when Flash. I saw this movie. For you the didn't first know who the Flash was? Not when we saw this for the first time. I didn't know anything about comic books. I knew who the Flash. I, was. I thought the I thought when they I thought I remember the first several times I saw this movie, like into my late teens and maybe early twenties. I thought they meant Flash Gordon. <laughs> when they said the Flash, I swear to God, I thought that they meant Barry Allen was like Flash Gordon from the the seventies cheesy movie. And there's so many great lines from this movie as well. In addition to the main ones that we've brought up, but also one of my favorites is where Frank says, I think it's something his father says, "An honest man has nothing to fear." I think Frank Senior says that an honest man has nothing nothing to fear, which is hypocritical because he's constantly being dishonest, meaning he's full of fear, mm-hmm. yeah. fear of losing everything. Yeah. I like um, <laughs> I love the knock knock joke <laughs> because Han Ratty's so. Would you like to hear a joke? <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I love how he's just an asshole. You know what I mean? He, he's an asshole to the other agents when at first in the car where he's like insulting them when he asks what they used to do, what departments they worked in before, and he's like, "Oh, I'm stuck with you guys." <laughs> and then and they're like, "What? Well, we'd love to hear you tell a joke." <laughs> knock knock, go fuck yourself. <laughs> <laughs> it gets me every time. I'd love to talk about some more different some differences between Frank's book and the movie, if that's cool with you. Sure. Now, we already talked about how Frank Abagnale Jr. in real life looked like an adult when he was a teenager, which is why he got away with so much and helped him with his scams as well as he never saw his father or mother again after the age of 16 when he ran away. But also, the Pan Am flight scam he did that originally just to get free flights. He wasn't trying to build a reputation to cash checks. He was already cashing checks successfully, but he did it to get free flights and fly around the world. And he flew to, I think like over 40 different countries over the time period. He did the uniform scam. He did the, the That's interview insane. scam. insane. Yeah. He did the wow. interview scam and he did the check scam with the logos from the model planes as well. Uh-huh. Now he was actually arrested during the Pan Am sequences for a period when people were questioning his identity. However, he had talked his way out of it from building a, re- a rapport with many employees and other pilots from Pan Am. They all vouched for him, basically. Like, so I he, know him. Yeah, but he yeah. actually got arrested because people thought that he wasn't who he was saying he was. Oh, my God. He came up with the doctor scam and con after actually befriending a doctor who lived in the same apartment building as him, and they actually got along and became friends. And then he's like, oh, I'm actually... I used to be a pediatrician myself or a doctor. And so they say, oh, we could use some help at the hospital. <laughs> and, but he, he only did it for a very brief amount of time. And he left being a doctor because similar to how that child comes in with a broken bone sticking out of its leg. And he's like sick it's... and sick his leg. <laughs> that meant, little child. I, meant, I was talking about the, the leg is it, not the child. The leg, the, the bone sticking out of the leg is uh-huh. it. <laughs> so the possessive of the leg? The leg. <laughs> bone sticking out of the leg he realized that he is in a terrible position he's putting people in more danger by being a fake doctor in a hospital sure yeah yeah so he left that brenda existed but she was a creation of multiple women that he dated but mostly based off an airline flight attendant that he fell in love with in real life and there was a woman that he also fell in love with who he confessed the truth of who he is to and she immediately called the fbi actually (laughs) but he got away and escaped them when they are coming after him uh-huh. but the the flight attendant that he fell in love with again was was actually from louisiana her father wasn't a lawyer but she knew a lawyer and like that's how he got connected with with taking the bar frank really did pass the bar and became a lawyer but left louisiana briefly um he became a professor of sociology actually as well at a college i can't remember what university it was but that was referenced basically in the movie as him teaching french for as a substitute teacher in high school. That was kind of like a reference and nod to him being a professor of sociology. He was wanted on over four continents. 
and he really did the flight attendant thing where he did the interviews to evade capture to fly. He attempted to retire at the age of 20 in France in a town close by to where his mother grew up. Unfortunately the, for him, the FBI tracked him down. Uh, like I said, Hanratty is based off Agent Joseph Shea. Frank Abagnale, the real Frank, is actually in the movie. He's got a cameo. He's one of the arresting officers in France when he comes out of the warehouse. Frank, like you said, really did escape a plane while on the runway through the kitchen area. He actually also escaped from prison in real life. Really? So he was arrested, and he got he was getting special treatment in prison, basically. And he had had business cards from an FBI agent that he had kept, and he had a girlfriend at the time, too. And so he was getting special treatment in, pr- in prison, and a lot of the guards didn't really know who he was, but they thought he might have been a prison inspector Kind of like a, a secret shopper for like a restaurant or a store, uh-huh. like kind of like there. He's not really an inmate, but he's pretending to be to kind of inspect the prison, make sure everything's going well and people are treated right as well as they get treated in prison, basically. But um, they didn't think he was a real inmate and basically conned the prison guards and staff by having his girlfriend make a bunch of these cards and, and bringing them to him, basically, and showing the prison guards that like, I'm actually... I'm a prison inspector. Like I need to get out of here. I'm I'm working undercover. I have to I have to leave. I have to go meet an FBI agent. I I can't have to do this in person. He basically he they let him leave the prison <laughs> as him conning them as a prison inspector. Oh my god! And he fled for a couple months. He was on the on the run, but he got picked up because a couple of off duty detectives recognized him, and to catch his attention, they yelled, "Hey, Frank!" And he immediately looked to them, and that's how they <laughs> picked him up again finally for the last time he got arrested. And he was in prison for five years until work release with the FBI. Uh-huh. Man, he must have been a real smooth talker. Like, imagine. Like, a master manipulator. Yeah, absolutely. And he, he must be an absolute, like, very suave individual to be able to manipulate that many people to like him. He must be extremely likable and extremely charismatic. Probably. He's got to be to be able to pull that shit off. Just like his father was. And to be that young, that's what I find so fascinating, how young he was when he did all this. Mm -hmm. I mean, I was still playing video games in my mom's basement. (laughs) 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 And he was- You were watching Taxi Driver on repeat. Yeah, yeah, that's true. And he was cashing checks and flying around on Pan Am. And Pan Am was one of the most respected companies in America and in the world at that time, like in the 60s. Pan Am was a big deal. Like they were, they were the airlines. You know what I mean? And we actually see a lot of that in The Aviator, another DiCaprio film. But Pan Am was. It's interesting that he was able to sneak his way into one of the biggest, most respected, powerful companies in American in the American economy. It's wild. It's crazy. Absolutely insane. It's unbelievable. But this movie's incredible. Um, do you have any anything else you'd like to discuss about Catch Me If You Can? I, I think we did a, a solid job. Uh, I love the film. I really do. And again, I, I got to say, as as fun and entertaining as the movie is, I think ultimately it really is a tragedy. And it's a terrific depiction of uh, the disillusionment of a family and, and self-destruction and the, the wayward approach towards the American dream that many people fall into. I mean, I th- I view it as both, you know, parts uh-huh. of it, like the f- destruction of a family, that's that's tragic. However, the adventure as well oh, yeah. as the conclusion and still kind of winning at the end <laughs> is a hap- is kind of a happy ending. I watched this, uh, I showed this to an ex, and <laughs> the movie was over and she was pissed that he was uh, super successful. <laughs> <laughs> She's like, so he stole all that money and then now they pay him? I was like, hey, he helps them. It's like all the scientists that came out of Germany. <laughs> but then I was, I was also like, he wasn't stealing from people. He was stealing from the banks. Well, and corporations. Yeah, and corporations. Yeah. So he was stealing from the, the wealthiest institutions in the world. So it's not really that bad. It wasn't that – was, he wasn't taking money out of people's ba- uh, bank yeah. accounts. It wasn't a ton of money yeah, either. Exactly, yeah. Like uh, I love when his mother's like, oh, uh, how much did he steal? I'm, I'll get my checkbook. I've been volunteering at the church. <laughs> uh, so far, it's up to $2.3 million, man. <laughs> <laughs> I love when Hanratty, he's just like being polite and being like, they've probably done this several times coming into homes of people to try to find Frank. But then when he sees the yearbook photo, everything just turns on a dime. He's like, oh, this is it. This is the guy. And then the music changes. And you, I love that moment. That's a great, great moment. And you can feel like the energy change. He's like, oh, uh, can I take this? All right. And then they, they bounce. It's great. This movie has a ton of energy. 
a ton of energy. <laughs> well, I also love. Uh, it, it cracks me up when he's trying to when he's telling the truth to Brenda and he pulls out the suitcase full of cash. <laughs> like there's so much money in it. She's like, "What? You're not, not a Lutheran?" Lutheran? <laughs> <laughs> like that's the biggest deal to her. Is that he's not a Lutheran. <laughs> I love it. I love it. <laughs> it's so damn good. Incredible movie. We adore Catch Me If You Can. It was so fun to finally visit this movie on an episode. It's something that. Y'all have been requesting for years now. We've been talking about doing for years, but finally found the time to do it. And what a bang this episode probably will be, I hope, because <laughs> I love this movie. I know so many people have been dying to listen to us cover this, and I'm excited for you to listen. Got your wallet. No, no. Your wallet. Your wallet. You got no one else to go. Why don't you hold on to it for me? <laughs> well, actually, I love when he's like, <laughs> Frank's like, you mind if I see some identification? <laughs> you never can be too careful. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. So damn love good. It. All right. Love Take it. care, everybody. Become a patron today at patreon.com slash Raiders of the Lost Podcast. Leave those five-star reviews and have a wonderful day. See you next time. This episode was executive produced by our chosen one patrons, Cody Moen. Andrew Hagen, Becca Keen, Benjamin Cook, Calvin Murphy Griggs, Nicholas Martin, Darian, Tyler McFly, and Sal Koching. Our Chosen One patrons are our biggest supporters. Thank you so much. Thank you for watching Raiders of the Lost Podcast. Be sure to hit that subscribe button, hit the like button as well, notifications for sure. Listen to the show on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, everywhere you can listen to podcasts. And be sure to check out this other content we have on our YouTube channel.